Welcome back to my channel for today's video. I am sharing to you a topic on how to learn and teach grammar and vocabulary. But before that, allow me to recognize our reference book by Vivian Cook on his book Second Language Learning and Teaching. The first topic we will discuss is on learning and teaching different types of grammar. The second is the topic on learning and teaching vocabulary. Now, what is grammar? I will tell you a story first of a Chinese learner and how did, you, how did she learn uh, grammar? As for grammar, this Chinese student could not grasp completely grammar. What they do is uh, they just uh, being corrected in written and spoken. So when they first encountered English grammar, it was difficult for her just a matter of memorizing the key sentences and the patterns by repeating and translating then they would be drilled repeated with the same pattern to consolidate them in their mind now when they are in secondary school uh, this girl in order to make her understand grammar the teacher would give them plenty of drills to do like matching gap filling and close testing but the most important the thing is they still cannot grasp the grammar so though they uh, she correct the wrong answers in drills they uh, she forget all the items after a couple of days now it is difficult thing for her to acquire grammar however developing a language sense is uh, some sort of thing they can use to do during their advanced English learning now, in order for us to get focus, we have our questions. Number one, what is grammar? Number two, how do you think it is learned? And number three, how would you teach it? Now, as we have been discussing on our previous lesson, we have the prescriptive grammar. This is mostly found on the school books. Uh, for example, in a sentence, this can't be put up with, or the Diabetes and letters to the newspaper about the split infinitive such as the star take motto to boldly go where no one has gone before So this is called prescriptive grammar because it prescribes uh, Just like the doctor uh, if the doctor describes prescribes a medicine so you cannot just go to the um, Drugstore and buy anything you want, but you have to have a prescription on the other hand, uh, it is rather than the descriptive as uh, they actually do. So one area where prescriptive grammar does still thrive is on spelling and punctuation. So where everyone believes that there is a single correct, so there is a single correct spelling for every word. For example, receive as receive or news as news. Now, in traditional grammar, we talk on the parts of speech, no, the fact that the noun is the word that is name of the person, place, things are absorbed by every school in the pupil in England. Uh, do you know that in England, in uh, 18th century form, grammar is still alive in the schools for today? If you ask a British undergraduates whether uh, they have been taught grammar, they invariably deny it. But if you ask them what is a noun, they nevertheless all know that it's the name of the person or thing. Someone has taught it to them. Now, language teaching has also made us structural grammar based on the concept of phase structure, which shows how some words go together in the sentence and some do not. In the sentence, the man fed the dog, the word the seems somehow to go with man but fed does not seem to go with the suppose we group the words that seems to go together the clearly goes with man so we can recognize the structure the man the goes with dog to get another the dog then these structures can be combined with the remaining words fed belongs to the the dog 
to get the new structure fed the dog. With that, the man in the man fed. Now the two structures, the man and the fed the dog, go together to assemble whole sentence. This phrase structure is usually presented in three diagram that shows how words build up into phrases and phrases build up into sentences. Now, there is an idea that grammar knowledge in the mind. So, second language accusation research relies only on another meaning of grammar. The knowledge of language that the speaker possesses in mind, known as linguistic or grammatical competence, originally taken from Noam Chomsky in 1960s. Grammatical competence, I mean the cognitive state that encompasses all those aspects of form and meaning in their relation, including underlying structures that enter into that relation, which are properly assigned to the specific subsystem of human mind that relates presentations of form and meaning. That's according to Chomsky 1980 on his book on page 59. Now, in order for us to focus on this next lesson, we have to focus on this question. Number one, what do you understand by a structure? Is it function or word? What do you think are the main characteristics of beginner sentences in English or another second language? In some second language accusation research, grammatical inflections like ing are grouped together with structure words like Two, as grammatical morphemes. In 1970s, Heldai Dulai and Marina Burt, 1973, decided to see how these structures, uh, morphemes, learned by the second language learners. They made Spanish-speaking children learning English-described picture and check how often they supplied eight grammatical morphemes in the appropriate places in sentence. One of the best demonstrations of the independence of interlanguage came from the research program by the European known as the Europe Science Foundation project by Klen and Perdue in 1977. Researchers found that basic grammar that the second language learners shared, which have three simple rules a sentence may consist of. Number one, the noun phrase followed by a verb. For example, Girl, take bread. Number two, a noun phrase followed by a copula and a noun phrase or an adjective. For example, it's bread. Number three, verb followed by a noun phrase. For example, pinching its. The second language learners not only have interlanguage grammar, they have also same interlanguage grammar regardless of the language they are learning and the first language they speak. In other words, all the teachers can actually expect from the learners after a year, so is a sparse grammar having these three rules. So whatever the teacher may try to do, this is what the learners can achieve. Now, do you find problems in following certain structure in the second language or in your first language? So why do you think some uh, find structures more difficult to follow than others. Let's try to find out. The problem with the research into sequence of acquisition was that it intended to say what the learners did, rather why they did it. An attempt was made to create a broader base sequence of development, first called the multidimensional model. Later, it was called the processability model, which believed that uh, the explanation of sequence must lie in the expanding capacity of learner's mind to handle grammar of the second language sentences. So the core idea was that some sentences are formed by moving elements from one position to another position. Now English questions, for example, move the auxiliary or the question word to the beginning of the sentence. A familiar idea to language teachers. So, for example, John is nice becomes is John nice by moving is to the beginning. John is where becomes where is John by moving 
first where then is and John will go where becomes where will John go by moving both where and will in front of John as you can see on the picture on the screen there are six stages of multi-dimension first learning to deal with words next with phrases and then with simple sentence finally the subordinate clauses in complex sentences the first stage is that the learners can produce only word at a time only one word at a time for example ticket beer or formula such as what's the time at this stage learners know content words but they have no idea of the grammatical structure the words come out in the stream grammatical morphemes as if he or the learners had a dictionary in their mind but no grammar that's the first stage the second stage is that the learner acquire typical word order of the language so in here both english and german this uh we have the most famous verb uh, subject verb order we have the uh, for example john likes beer this is only one word order that the learners know so this is the subject verb object order or the svo order they do not have any alternative word order based on movement as question so uh, they put negatives on the front of the sentence for example no me live here and make questions with rising intonation just as you like me both of which maintain the basic word order of english without needing movement the third stage now is that the learner starts to move elements from the beginning of the sentence so they put adverbials at the beginning for example on tuesday i went to london so they use wh words at the beginning of the word with inversion so who lives in come them and they move auxiliaries to get yes or no questions for example will you be there so the typical sentences at this stage on the stage three are yesterday i sick beer i like in both of which the initial element has may has been moved from later in the sentence the fourth stage of this is the learners discover how preposition can be separated from its phrase for example the patient he looked after rather than the patient after which he looked a phenomenon technic technically known as preposi prepositioning standing so the preposition stranding means the antithesis of the prescriptive grammar rule so they also start to use the ing ending for example i am reading a book the fifth stage is on the question word questions such as where is he going to be the third person grammatical morpheme s he likes and the detrive with two he gave his name to the receptionist at this stage the learners are starting to work within the structure of the sentence not just using the beginning or the end as locations to move elements another new feature is the third person s ending of the verbs for example he smokes on the sixth stage the final stage is acquiring the order of subordinate clauses so in english this sometimes differs from order in main clause the question order is will he go but the reported question is jane asked if he would go not jane asked if he would go to the despair of generalizations of efl students so in this stage the final stage the learner is sorting out more untypical orders in subordinate clauses after the ordinary main clause order has been learned now this is these are the implications in teaching grammar first do not teach the child immediately the third person s number two in the early stages concentration of the main word 
the SVO should be given first. Okay? The number three, we introduce sentence in initial adverbials uh, as way into the movement involved. Questions like, uh, do you, Brahms? Now, on the next, we are going to focus on the questions, do you think that you learned your first language entirely from your parents or is it from someone else? Now, if you came from Mars, okay, what would you say all human languages had in common? Now, one principle that's been proposed is called the locality. Now, the question is how do you explain to a student how to make English questions such as, Is Sam the cat that is black? One possible construction is to describe the movement involved. So, start from the sentence, Sam is the cat that is black and move the second word is to the beginning so this is the clear answer to patch it up you might suggest move the copula is to the beginning so it becomes is the old man the one who's late so but suppose the student wants to make a question out of Sam is the cat that is black um, it will become is Sam is the cat that black? It is obvious to us that no one would ever dream of producing this question, but why not? It is just a possible logically to move one is as the other. To sum it up, the second language learners do not need to learn principles of universal grammar as they will use them automatically. The second language learners need to acquire new parameter settings for parameters such as prodrop, often starting from their first language. All second language learners can be looked at with the same overall framework of grammar as it applies for all the languages. Now, another question do we have here is that what do you think is the easy grammar for a beginner and what do you think is the best order of teaching grammar? As Robert Dickey's sir 2005 points out, it is almost impossible to uh, researchers to agree with forms are more complex which comparatively simple. When language use and classroom tasks become more important to teaching, the choice of the teaching sequence was no longer straightforward since some way of sequencing these non-grammatic items needed to be found. Now, the second language acquisition research has often claimed that there are definite orders for learning language, particularly for grammar. So, what should teachers do about this? Now, we have five, okay? I will sum up it with five. First, we have to ignore the parts of grammar that have particular second language learning sequence. Second, Follow the second language learning order as closely as possible. And then third, teach the last thing as in as a second language learning sequence first. And then final, uh, ignore grammar altogether. So that's how is it. Now, the next question is on uh, did hearing about grammar from your teacher help you learn a second language or in what way? The next is that how aware are you of grammar when you were speaking your first language or your second language? Let's try to find out. Teachers have to be aware of many ways in which grammar comes into language learning and use as many types of grammar that exist in choosing which grammar to teach and how to teach it. So the second learners, second language learners, uh, go through distinct stages of acquisition for reasons still only partially understood. Now teaching can utilize the known facts about these stages in several ways. Many aspects of grammar do not need to be taught as they are already present in learner's mind and need instead to be activated. So, conscious explanation of the second language grammar is seen as beneficial in some circumstances, as is raising of the language awareness. Now, that's all for the teaching and learning grammar. Let's proceed now to the learning and teaching vocabulary. 
Now, when you learn a new word in your second language, how do you try to keep this it separate from the words from your first language? Uh, number two is when you teach a new word, uh, do you try to link it to words in your first language, say by translation, or do you keep it separate? So let's try to find out. The first language and the second language sets of vocabulary are in the second language user's mind, may be related in various ways. So, research suggests that in many cases, there are two vocabulary stores are closely linked. Now, talking about word frequency, I have a question again. What do you think are the 10 most frequent words in English? So, would you teach them all together to the beginners or uh, how do you think frequency is important? Now, most teaching has been based on the idea that the most frequent words in the target language should be taught first. Almost all beginners' books restrict the vocabulary they introduce in the first year to about 1,000 frequent. So, do you know that the most frequent word is the? It occurs 6 million times, 187,000 times, and 267 times. And the 50th word, her, is um, 200,018 and 258,000 times, as you can see on the screen. Since they are structured words such as articles, the pronouns, pronouns it, auxiliaries would, and forms of the verb be, Usually, the teaching of structure words is seen as uh, part of grammar, not the part of the vocabulary. So, frequency is taken to apply to more content words. Nevertheless, we should not forget that the most frequent words in the language are mostly structured words. The top 100 words only in include three nouns. Now, the list also has some surprise for the teachers. Now, as you observe, the nouns, government, and system, uh, and then the verbs become, and then the theme, uh, and the adjective social and public are seldom taught in beginners' courses despite their high frequency. So many of the nouns have vague uh, general meanings like the people, a thing. Uh, many are abstract like seem or available or involve subjective evaluation like think and good. Typically, the first lesson of the elementary concentrates on specific concrete nouns like cinema, shops, and verbs, actions such as study, visit. In a nutshell, for a conclusion, frequency is usually established nowadays from a larger corpus of a language, such as the BNC for English. Words vary extremely in how often they are used, and frequency is only one factor that uh, choice of words is to teach. Now, on the knowledge of words, we have here the question, what do you think about the word uh, like man if you speak English? And then when you teach students the meaning of the word, what do you mean by meaning and how do you teach it? Now, we have forms of uh, the word. We have the pronunciation. Okay, we know that man is pronounced as man, which word is associated in our memory. So, for instance, man is pronounced as man. Okay, so number two is spelling. Okay, if we can read, we can know that uh, word is spelled as man. So, words have specific spellings and are linked to the specific rules and such as uh, the language chairman. And then the third is on the grammatical property, okay? So, in these grammatical properties, we know that the word man is either a noun, a man, okay? Or a verb, to man. So, that is say, uh, we know that the grammatical category that each word belongs to, okay? So, this dictates how it is behaves in the structure of the sentence. So, for example, as a noun, man can be object of the sentence. For example, the man left. They shoot the man. 
If it is a verb, it can be part of the verb phrase. For example, they manned the barricades. Like most nouns, it will uh, have pos possessive forms like mans and the plural form men. While mans as a noun occurs 58,769 times in the BNC as a verb, it only occurs 12 times. See? Number two is possible and impossible structures. So we know that the type of structure that man can be used in. So when man is a verb, the sentence must have a subject that is animated she. So uh, she meant the barricades, not it meant the barricades. So it does not fit. So it should be they meant the barricades. Okay. So this is called argument structure of the verb which arguments or may not go to or with the structure of the sentence. Next is the idiocratic grammatical information. So the plural spoken form of man is men, right? So the written form is men. For example, we know that it is an exceptional to the usual rules of forming the noun because the usual plural form of noun is adding s, right? So, in addition, the noun man can be either countable as in Robert Burns, a man's, a man for that, or uncountable as in Alexander Pope. The proper study of mankind is man, depending on the sense with which it is used. And then finally, the word building. So, in word building, there is a whole family of words related to man, such as manish, manlike, and manly made by various prefixes such as an and suffixes such as ish to the stem man now let us proceed to lexical properties so we have the collocations for example man conventionally goes with other words such as my good man man in the street man to man man of god to separate the men from bo the boys, my man gives and my many others. Number two is appropriateness. So, for example, my man may be used as form of address. For example, hi my man. The prime minister might be surprised at being greeted with hi my man. A pop star might not. We have to know when and with whom is appropriate to use a word. And then on the meaning, we have the general meaning and the specific meanings. So, uh, talking about man again, so we know the general properties about the meaning of man such as male, adult, human being, concrete, animated. And then these aspects of meaning called semantic features, components of meaning. So, in semantic in specific meanings, so we know that a range of specific senses of man. The OED has 17 main entries for a man only, as a noun ranging from a human being to one of the pieces used in chess. Next is on types of meaning. So this is our focus question. What do you mean by meaning? So what nouns can you remember learning first in your first language? And in your second language, what do you remember? So it seems enough to say that a word means okay so uh, we have here the components of meaning the lexical relations and the prototypes so components of meaning often uh, the meaning of a word can be broken up into smaller components so for example the meaning of the girl is made up of female human and non-adult so the meaning of apple is made up of fruit edible round and so on so the components view of meaning was used to study the development of words such as before and big in English children. So at one stage, they know one component of the meaning but not the other. So they know big and small share the meaning component to do with size, but think they both mean big or they know that before and after are to do with time but do not know which one means prior. That's according to Clark 1971. So the second language learners beginners in English 
indeed found it much easier to understand. For example, Mary talks before Susan shouts. Then, Caroline signs after Sally dances. That's according to Cook, 1977. On number two, lexical relations. So, words do not exist by themselves. Now, we cannot, they cannot go alone, but only in relation to other words. So, the meaning of, for example, the, the hot relates to cold. The meaning of run, to walk. The high, to low. Of plain, or pain, to pleasure, and so on. So, when we speak, we choose one word out of all those we have uh, available words. Okay? So, rejecting all the words we could have said. For example, I love you, potentially with I hate you. Words function within system of meaning. A metaphor that is often used for meaning is the traffic lights. Okay, so do you know traffic lights, right? So when a traffic light has two colors, red and green, red means stop. Okay, so that contrasts to the green means go. So therefore, red doesn't just mean stop, but it also means not green or don't go. Understood? And then the fin finally, prototypes, some aspects of meaning cannot be split up into components but are taken in a whole. That's according to Eleanor Rusk. So, on his prototype theory. So, an English person uh, who is asked to give an example of typical bird is more likely to say sparrow than penguin or ostrich. So, sparrows are closer to the prototype for birds in the mind than penguins or ostriches. So, in general, words have many different kinds of meaning, whether sharing general components linked in lexical relations or related to prototypes and levels. So, we have here another topic on the strategies of how we are going to learn vocabulary. So, I have a question again for you. Number one, if you meet a new word, how do you go about finding out its meaning and remembering it? Number two, how do you use the dictionary in your second language or in your first? Now, students are often acutely aware of their ignorance of the vocabulary. Me, myself, sometimes, I also admit that. Unlike their unawareness of the ignorance of grammar and phonology, when you want to say something in a second language, it's the, it's the words that you feel you struggle rather than the grammar or the pronunciation. So, therefore, the second language learner users have devised strategies to know, compensate for words they do not know. So we have here the strategies of understanding the meaning of words. First, the most famous one, the use of dictionary. Um, and we have also the uh, two types of the dictionary. We have the monolingual versus translation dictionaries. So if you believe that the word stores of the two languages must be kept in distinct in mind, you will go for the monolingual second language dictionaries. But if you believe that the words for the two languages are effective kept in one joint store, you will prefer the uh, prefer translation dictionaries. The next type of dictionaries is uh, reception versus production dictionaries, such as the language activator in 1933 dictionaries. So, production dictionaries permit one to hunt for the precise word to express something one wants to say. So, if you decide to talk about your problems, you look up the concept of problem and see which of the 12 related ideas, for example, ways of saying the person causes problems, best expresses what you want to say, then a version of uh, this is found in the thesaurus forms. And finally, we have the corpus-based, example-based dictionaries. We have the traditional dictionaries, uh, such as the OED, depended on the collecting a large sample. So, in the recent dictionaries, uh, have been based on large-scale collections of real spoken and written language process by the computer. So, this is on the corpus-based and uh, uh, very... Uh, well known on our time today. Now, how would you teach a new word such as trombone to a student? Let's try to find out. Or do you use any local words in your first language? 
or in your second language that people from other areas don't understand. So, in general, when we teach the complexity of words, uh, we fit in the student's strategies. We teach them the basic level of words first, and then we teach lexical relationships, and then we think about the first presentation of the word, and then we teach them some words through components of meaning. And then remember, it is how the word is practiced, not how often. That is very important. So also remember students transfer from uh, learning language, the first language acquisition meaning as well as the words themselves. So we put words in their structural context. For further readings, you might get interested on the following books and with many exercises. And that's it for today's video. Please do not forget to click like and subscribe to this channel for more language learning related videos. Once again, this has been Teacher Al, Abdul Qadir Al-Sofi. See you again on my next video.